Richardson is a maritime advisory. We do projects like this on a global basis. But there is a guy who is really Paul Richardson. And uh, some people think that Malcolm McLean is the inventor of containerization. And many people credit Paul Richardson with being the godfather. He took it from, uh, he took Sealand from one ship in a service to Europe to service in 65 countries and uh, 400 ships a week. So over the last uh, couple of decades, he's had this advisory service that I've been uh, really proud to be part of. Worked on a number of projects here in Delaware. We'll mention some of those. It's good to see folks that I haven't seen in a while. But two of my colleagues that I want to introduce, uh, Brad Winfrey, who uh, heads up the terminal practice, and Ray Cavarda, who's on the business planning process. As Bill mentioned, um, this is a public forum, and it's to give you information about where the project is. The project is not complete in the sense of a report. So the first question is why? And why are you doing this? And it's pretty simple. If, if, uh, if you look at it, it's employment opportunities, as Bill and Tom Ford mentioned this morning. There's no doubt that the maritime sector in the Goodlands creates unbelievable regional economic impact. It's, it's not us that is, are that is saying this. There's a lot of folks, a lot of experts, a lot of scholars all say the same thing. The maritime industry creates the greatest regional economic impact. It beats banking, retail, technology, insurance, it's by far the greatest generator of dollars, direct dollars, indirect dollars, induced dollars, related dollars. So what we're looking at here is creating those kind of employment opportunities. And as Bill mentioned, it's not just about longshore. There's all types of spin-off opportunities. And last but not least, let's, uh, we've got to tee up the state of Delaware for the next 30, 50, 75 years. Because that's the life of the port. And you're making a decision today, or not today, but through this process, we're starting to make a decision today about how the state's going to be positioned for decades. That's, that's what we're looking at. That's the type of decision that you're uh, going to be making. So how do we do it? Good one more time. It's a public-private partnership. I know many of you have heard that in the past, the P3. Um, one more time, Lance. This is not a request for public dollars. We gotta make that clear. This is not a request for the state or anybody else to build it and to expand your dollars on this project. Uh, in fact, what this is, one more time. This P3, I want to make clear, is in no way <coughs> similar to the exercise that might or may not have been run with the Diamond State Port Corporation a couple of years back. I know some of you may have heard that. There's a similarity, private, public. <coughs> it doesn't compare to that process. And I'll show you in a couple of slides why there's a difference. One more time, Lance. Let's take a, a look at how it works. And this is just a example. I'm not saying that this is a magic potion, but this is a, a very possible way in, in which it, it could be put together. So there's a private landholder. And that private landholder has a potential transaction. Let, let's just dream and say maybe he sells that land. Or maybe goes into business with some other private parties. Those other private parties are uh, investment firms, developers, terminal operators, ocean carriers, and the railroads. They're the key stakeholders of any port. So let's just recap. Private landholder, he may or may not sell the land, maybe he goes in business with them, and he hooks up with 
the other private stakeholder parties in a port transaction. That's these folks. Good. It's all private enterprise. It's all private dollars. And just like anything else that happens in the past in terms of a private company going forth with an idea for development to a public agency, it's at this point that they get the public part of a 3P, public-private partnership, to work. So the public agency, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the land ownership and why land ownership from a public domain is important. But what does the public agency offer? They offer integrated economic development, infrastructure, roads, highways, railroads, hospitals. That's very, very important to private parties as they develop a project such as this at scale. Also, the regulatory process. We recognize that there's a regulatory process in a city, a regional, a state, and a federal level. And the state offers assistance with that. Financial platform, I don't want to get lost on that yet. I'll bring that around. It's just to say there's no expenditure of public dollars. But here, as this happens, when this private enterprise comes to the public agency, there's a decision. And the public officials get a chance to say yay or nay. There's an offering. They could say this is really good for the state, or they could say it's not so good. Maybe come back to us with another um, party or with another uh, project. But what this allows you to have is the ability for the public agency to sign on without expending dollars. They get to pass judgment. They can say, I want to saddle up, or I want to let this one go. But here's something that's important. The land, in some way, and I don't want to get lost on the mechanics, and I'll, I'll, fill it, I'll keep filling it in, but just take a message here. It's very important that the land, however the land is defined as dirt, or maybe some improved ground, remains under the ownership of the public domain, or is recognized. That's where it converts to the public in full force. Now, how can that happen? Well, maybe the public agency buys the land from the private stakeholder parties. Maybe they put some skin in the game and they go into business together, the public agency and the private stakeholders. Maybe they have a deferred payment. That decision, I don't want to get lost on. But it's important that the private parties give the land and it's looked at as owned by a public domain, even though it may be developed by private stakeholder parties. The private stakeholder parties get, in return for developing it, a long-term concession to operate. So they break the ground, they build it, and then they get to operate. That concession could be 30 years, 50 years, 75 years, 99 years. Again, that's the state or the public <coughs> agencies that decide that. But when that long-term concession is over, the asset <coughs> reverts back to the public domain. So the citizenry always own the asset. Deep down, they will have somebody else may be developing it, somebody else may be operating it, they may be private parties, private stable parties, it could be an enterprise where there's partners, but at the end of the term, the asset reverts back to the people. If we could. Now, I mean, timing's everything, right? So we all remember when the president came through the Port of Wilmington this summer to talk about infrastructure. This is a poster child project for what he was talking about. This project is absolutely 100% consistent. It in fact will be submitted to the 
U.S. Department of Transportation as a potential project to be selected on a federal level to go forward as an example of what, how a public-private partnership could work in the future, particularly in port business. You heard a little bit about this. Very important. Um, the idea here is not to take away cargo from the existing Diamond State uh, War Corporation. In fact, it is meant to run consistent and complement the assets that the state already has. We're not out to replicate it. We're not out to reallocate it. We're out to make it better and enhance it. And if you look at this, you know, I, I call it the three legs of the stool. You've got the existing Diamond State. You've heard the mention of the GM distribution capability. That's right in the middle. And then you have this Greenfield facility. A lot of potential here. If you tie these assets together in an integrated plan that's coordinated, you're not only going to retain, but you're going to grow. And that's what we want to do, is creating competitive advantage for this port. You have this infrastructure in place. There are 10 rail lines. There's a connectivity between the two sites. It's all the pieces are falling in place. Good. So let's acquaint yourself. Tomoko mentioned uh, you know, where the, the site is. If we look at this, you'll see the existing operation, the railroad line that runs between the two of them, the new uh, Greenfield site. Good. This is uh, the existing Diamond State Port Corporation facilities, and as uh, we mentioned, so if we take a look here. This is what Bill was talking about as what was mentioned at one time, maybe a greenfield development in the existing facility. That's currently dredge spoils highly regulated as to the use for the future. And in terms of speed to market, how quick this thing can come up and be developed and operated, we're pretty confident that that particular piece of land would be much longer to develop than that other site, that Greenfield site, what we're calling Greenfield site. Take home message though. But channel, as we've all heard it, is being dredged to 45 foot. This river where the existing container operation is, is at 38 feet, and that's the maximum. So this is up against constraints. It's up against constraint from the water side, and as Bill mentioned, you are, and many of you know, and there's a few uh, Diamond State Port Corporation officials here. Every morning they wake up and put seven pounds through a five pound bag. And they do it well. But it's starting to get to the point where it's constrained, unless money is put in. How do we tee it up for the next 50 years without putting some serious dollars? Dollars that no public agency has. We all now read and hear about the fiscal crisis, there is not the public dollar any longer. So how do we overcome this? How do we position ourselves for the future? How do we create economic impact jobs, get this from 38 feet to where it should be? Good lands. We start looking at this Greenfield site, which absolutely, <coughs> I'm gonna say now, it's, there are some hurdles in front of it in terms of things that we have to work together to overcome like coastal zone management and wetlands and dredging and those issues, all of which I think in a coordinated effort we can get our arms around. Even with that, this is a much faster process versus what was that grid spoil site there. So just to give you a flavor, as you all know, if you're local, here's those three legs to the stool, and that's this coordinated policy or, 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 or development 
is very important and it really does translate to economic engine. It, it's a generator of economic impact. Let's do it one more time, Lance. So, yeah, I'm going to mention a couple of things in, in, in the jargon of the industry, just so you all know. A 20-footer, or a TEU, a 20-foot equivalent unit, that's the smaller one that you see on the road. So two of those equal a 40-footer, an FEU. So when I talk about TEUs, that's how big it is. Two of those equal an FEU, that's how big it is. This is not our job. This is, and I'm going to put up a, a, a lot of reference material from other experts. We're all saying the same thing. And you've been reading about a lot of what's taking place as well. These are the major trade lanes in the world. Look where they're all pointed. I mean, all roads lead to Wilmington, if we could. But in a couple of years, the game changer is going to be the Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal is going to allow the biggest of vessels to come through. Today, there's the, the limit for a vessel to go through today is about 4,900 TEU. And when the Panama Canal is done in roughly a year or 18 months, that number will be closer to 12,800 TEU. So those much bigger vessels are going to be coming through, making their way from Asia and on to the East Coast. But here's a point, and I'm not gonna bore you with pie charts, believe me. And most of you can't read this anyway in the back, but this is the container traffic on the East Coast for 2014 first half. The take home message here is that the Delaware Bay and River ports are not even in this illustration. This illustration comes from a trade journal that everybody, it's the Bible, the Journal of Commerce in our industry. They neither list Wilmington nor Philadelphia. It doesn't even make the cut. You're such a small player in their view of the world and in some other folks' view that they're not even listed. <clears throat> if you look at the big players, New York, New Jersey, 30%. Norfolk, 12 or 13 percent. Baltimore, 14 percent. Stay with me on this. Number one, you don't even make a cut today. Number two, your neighbors to the north and the south, you took Baltimore, <coughs> Norfolk, and New York and New Jersey. Those three are about 60 percent of the entire East Coast market. If we could land. Same thing, but I want to make it clear that there are good things happening on the Delaware. I mean, Philadelphia, it's grown by 29%. You probably all have read it. And they're doing the same thing. They do a great job in the sense of getting seven pounds in a five pound bag. Diamond State Port Corporation has 329,000 TEUs worth of cargo. We just talked about it being full, but yet, when you compare to what other ports are doing, you're not on the scale. You're doing good in your neighborhood. You're doing good on your river. There's growth, 29% growth in Philadelphia, double digit growth in Wilmington. But it's still not comparing. Why? Because all this cargo is going to other regional ports. And we know that that cargo is only growing. You go to Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's. When's the last time you picked up anything that says made in the USA? It's all made in Malaysia, Vietnam, China. It's only going to continue. We could miss. I'm not going to get lost on this. I'm just going to say here it is. The number one port range is the West Coast, Los Angeles, Long Beach. Number two is your neighborhood. New York, Norfolk, here's Wilmington, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Number two trade lane in North America. That's the take home message. Number one on the East Coast, 
that triangle. This is not us. This is another expert that has come in and said, here's the number two in North America. Another eye exam. But what this says, and this is not us, this is America 2050, very well respected Washington based think tank. And here's what they're saying. You know, if you look into the future to 2050, whoever links this area with this area is the winner. That's these mega regions. That's where all this is going to, this growth and development is going to take place. So if you have a port that can bring cargo through it and deliver it to and from these regions, you've got a winning formula. And I ask you, what's the closest port to that region? Uh, yeah. Norfolk's in there. Baltimore's in there. Wilmington should be in there. And that's what this project's all about, is connecting this available market. Here's what your friends are doing. That's New York. Five million TEU a year. Here's Norfolk. Two million. Baltimore, 800,000. And when you look at Wilmington and Philadelphia, the Delaware Bay and River, it's got a flat line, right? That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like compared to your neighbors. You're good. In reality, you're doing very well. You've done a very good job. This one line represents Philadelphia's red. The blue is Diamond State. Every year you're growing. I'm not out here to say that the port in the Diamond State Port Corporation is not taking advantage of what they have. I think you are. I think if you had more to offer, you'd have even more cargo. And why do I think that? Because when we combine the two ports would take the Delaware Bay and River as a whole, if we could. That's the last 30 years. It's over 500% growth. It's over 20% a year on average. That's how you bank on the future. That's the kind of return we all want to benefit from. This is an available market. This is what you're doing today. Phenomenal job over the last 30 years. But remember, you're at 329,000 TEU. New York's at five and a half million. Norfolk's at two and a half million. Baltimore's at 800,000. It's time to get the freight. That is your birthright. You're blessed with geography. And this project is looking to connect all of that, if we could wait. No more charts. Let's go to the pictures. Pictures worth 10,000 words. I don't even talk anymore. So we're, what are we doing? And uh, my colleagues are here. We have the other team in some of the, the previous meetings. Here's our existing channel. Here's what has to be dredged as part of the project to bring that to 45 feet. Here's the actual lands and some of the concepts we've looked at for this new terminal. Thanks if you could hit it. Thanks. So it's state of the art. And the beauty of a greenfield is that it's a clean piece of canvas. You're not trying to run an existing operation while you're building a new one. So we all know the hassle of you know adding the addition onto the house or whatever it may be. It's tough to live and build and develop. The beauty of this is you get a clean piece of canvas. It's state of the art. And I'm going to show you what we're doing conceptually. You know, we're doing the right thing by the wetlands. We're doing the right thing by coastal zone management. We're building what we think is the appropriate type of remediation into the process so that we'll get those approvals that we see, if you could. This is it. I mean, this is the actual model. This is the real piece of land with the real model, and we are measuring 
what it means to the impacts, not only in the environment on truck movements or rail movements, but nitrous oxide and all the other pieces, light pollution, noise pollution, very, very favorable. And part of the reason why is because, as Tomoko explained, when you drive in from Cherry Lane, you are viewing it downward. There's a natural slope that isolates the noise and the light. The question is, how much do we go in the river? And we're, we're still playing with that. Is it less expensive and easier to go landside and build up or out in the water? Right here, we think it's a pretty good mix. But that is the actual schematic against the actual plot line of the land. Why are we doing all this? I'm going to bring it in, uh, in a couple of slides. We're at the level of discussion now with this project that people want to see this level of detail. They want to start to begin to say, do I need 31 cranes or do I need 37 cranes? Do I need eight cranes here? What's the lanes? And what is the potential for this operation? Once again, this is the actual land site. So it's about as real as we can get. It's the closest thing to a video game that we can provide for. Lance. So the big difference here uh, and the, the folks that work in Diamond State Port Corporation will recognize this right away, is that there's no chassis on the terminal. Because today, Dolan, Pachita, you use the box right on the set of wheels. It takes up more space. You can't go higher. That's the beauty of this. You just stack them up. There's no longshoremen driving around in a dangerous, unsafe environment. They're up here doing their thing, delivering it to the back ends. So it's all about speed, the velocity, it's moving that cargo in the most efficient and quickest way possible. A large component of it is the rail. Not only is it economically sound, environmentally sound, less truck traffic, congestion on the roads. So we are planning this all out. It's at this level of how many tracks, how many trucks per day, how many cranes, how does it all come together? What does it cost to build it out? And I'll get to that. Lance, just an aerial to give you a flavor for the difference here is that this is just stacks of cargo. You're using the land in the most efficient way, the highest density versus today's operation, which is you only get one level high it, for the most part of the port. This is stacked six, seven, eight high. And there's not people or trucks running around. Here, there's all delivery being done on the backside. So it's coming off the vessel into a rail, I'm uh, sorry, into a rail mounted gantry crane. And that's bringing it back and forth and then it's being delivered to the rail head, a rail car or a truck. You know, why is this important? Because we are already thinking about the most minimal environmental impact. All of this is incorporating the environment. What we're doing here is designing truck lanes so that the trucks are being serviced while they don't idle. They can actually become uh, into the terminal, signal through RFID, radio frequency, my colleague, is an expert on that. So easy pass, but then dream with me for a second. You go through the toll at the Delaware Memorial. It pays your easy pass. That same easy pass identifier signals to this gate that that truck's on its way. The truck matches the container. So when he comes through, it's not like today where you sit at the gate for an hour and try to get resolution. Your container is already being delivered out of the stack, so when the truck makes its way through to the terminal, it's all ready to rock and roll. Same thing on the way out. So keep going. The 
this, I'll, I'm just going to tell you, we're at that level of discussion with stakeholder parties where they want to see 30 or percent or so type of conceptual drawings. Because they want to hone in on the actual dollars. Start to do the modeling. Now we go back to that. And I'll tell you if you could hit it. Why are we doing that? It's because these investment firms, the developers, the terminal operators, this is where we are right now. We're gathering up these private stakeholder parties. We're showing them the models. We're altering the models based on their requests. We're putting the financials together because Hopefully, in a short process, they're going to come together as the private enterprise and come to the public agency. So here's where we are today. How long that takes, I'm not quite sure. We're going to corral them all. And we're doing things a little bit different than uh, maybe some of the other ports where they go out for a request for proposal. We're trying to hone in on the greatest potential. What type of investors are looking at this? Pension funds, people that are in it for the game for 20 or 30 years. Um, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is one of the largest terminal operators. So the retired teachers in Canada have five marine terminals spread throughout the United States because they're in it for a 20 or 30 or 40 year picture and accrual. Who's some of, some of the other folks that are investing in these types of projects that we're talking to about Wilmington? Sovereign wealth. You know, these, these countries where the guy that you're talking to, his picture's on the money. They're coming from a whole different place. They're not looking for a return in a year or three years. They've got a 40 or 50 year Time or Please. These teachers are usually making a dollar. I checked. They have roughly about $80 million that could we possibly tap into that if, if we could do it the right way and, and, and invest it and do it ourselves? With $8 billion, anything's possible. <laughs> 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 well, funny, I'm speechless because, uh, yeah, we've got to go see them. Um, this project wouldn't even make that round though at eight billion. I mean that's it's the same type of thing that we So let's close with one slide and bring it back to why we're all here. Uh, this is gonna be tough to read, but I'll read it to you. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Okay. Today and this is not us counting the jobs. These are all these other industry experts who are doing the same thing. Today, there are about 17,000 jobs of all classifications, direct, indirect, induced, and related for Wilmington. About 17,000. You handle 330. Let's not hit you up, guys. Um, Look at these other ports. Savannah, 360,000 jobs related to the port. Charleston, 260,000 jobs related to the port. North Carolina, 65,000. Baltimore, 108,000. Norfolk, over 100,000. New York, New Jersey, 279,000. Jacksonville, Florida, 132,000. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this matrix? This is where it's got to happen. Why are you flat lines? Because that flat line of market growth, even though when you look at it in your world, you're doing really good. You're growing every year. But when you look at it versus the East Coast and how you're setting up for the future, it becomes very clear. No cargo, or less cargo, I should say, equals a lot less jobs. 
This is all cargo that is naturally aligned to markets that you can service best. From here to the near Midwest, from here to Chicago and back. That's the job we're talking about. So direct, and as Bill mentioned, it's not just about long term, it's all these trucking, rail, tenants, pilots, tugs, the channel, the indirect jobs. So you know, providing goods and services and doing maintenance and repair, equipment, utilities, fuel, insurance, banking, it just goes on and on. That's the beauty about this industry. Anything it touches, it created economic impact. Induced, people are being paid $15 an hour, $25 an hour, $35 an hour, whatever those wage scales are that are hooked to this industry. They're out buying food, going to dinner, mortgages, making revisions to their house, buying different cars, getting medical, medical packages. Why? Because they have health insurance with that job. So they get the premier service and all that is spin off. Retail, they're buying things, apparel, same thing. They're putting clothes on their back and they're pushing their kids back. So it's still hold there, hold there. So with that, I'll close and we will shut down. Um, any questions? I know I've thrown a lot of pack loads out here. Does somebody want to go back to the picture?